Isaiah 61, 1 to 11. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance for our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of spirit of despair. They will, be, they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have devastated for genera- been, dev- been devastated for generations. Aliens will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards and will be called priests of the Lord and we name ministers of our God. We will feed, you will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of their shame, my people receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit, inherit a double portion in their land, and everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and e- inequity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who who see them will acknowledge, and they are a people the Lord has blessed. I I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom adores his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with, with herself with jewels. For as the soil makes the young plant come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Amen. Thank you very much, Thomas. So I'm very pleased that I get to talk to you about another week of hope. This is the third week in a row that we'll be considering hope. And today it is hope for the present. You might wonder, well, then why are we reading a passage that was written 2,800 years ago if it's hope for the present? Well, there was loads and loads of hope for the people of Israel. Loads of hope for them. Isaiah Isaiah was writing this so much hope for them. I have to say that the the book of Isaiah itself is so fully describes the person of Jesus, his sufferings and his kingdom. Sometimes Isaiah is called the fifth evangelist because he talks so much about Jesus. There's more quotations in the New Testament taken out of Isaiah than out of all the other prophets. So the reason that it's hope for the present is because one day in the town of Nazareth, a man named Jesus came into the synagogue on the Sabbath like he would normally do, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. And if you haven't noticed, I am reading from Luke chapter 4 here. He said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat back down. In this text, it says, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue was fastened on him. Can you imagine? Jesus has just quoted scripture. He's just quoted the passage that we just read in Isaiah. And everybody's waiting for what he has to say next. 
And he says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And that's why it's hope for the present. Isaiah was written for hope for the Israelites. Jesus reread it in a new way, in a really fresh way, and said, this is now hope for us all. People would have been astonished. He speaks of the year of favor, the year of jubilee. I just have to explain this. Leviticus 25.10 said, Consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants, and it will be a jubilee for you. So a jubilee for people, whether they had 49 years to go until the jubilee year or one year to go, filled them with hope. Why? Because if they didn't have any hope, it gave them hope. If they were in bondage, they were promised liberty. If they were seriously in debt, they were promised grace. Their debts would be erased. If they were feeling sorrowful, God promised them joy. And there's so many clear images of jubilee, of hope that's scattered throughout Isaiah 61, that it's an amazing text for Jesus to say, now our hope is present again through me. Now, I see three different clear images. There's actually more than that. But I see three that connect with me that speak to the hope that is the present that we find in Jesus. The first one, stick with me, does anyone know what a phoenix is? John knows. Oh, oh, here's a hint. Robert is doing this. Do you know what a phoenix is? It is a type of bird. Well done, Hannah. Now, specifically, it's a, it's a, ma- a made-up bird. It's not a real bird, unfortunately. Um, and it's this bird that soared the skies for 600 years, and then all of a sudden, it was consumed in this fire. Oh, sad. But eventually, it rose from its ashes to an even greater glory and an even greater beauty. Now, this is a made-up story. The Greeks did it. And I'm not a really big fan of mythology. That's what that is. But still, I think it's a pretty interesting, interesting thing. When I was looking all this stuff up, I found a story about two years ago. There was a seagull that had gotten into a big vat of turmeric. And people were like, oh, it's a phoenix. But no, it's actually just a seagull. So if you want to pretend that phoenixes are real, you can. Anyway, so I've got a bit of trivia for you. Um, I don't know if you know this, but I'm, I'm actually not from here. Uh, not, from, not from Pakistan. No, John. If only. Um, so uh, does anyone know where I'm from originally? America, yes. Uh, Now, bonus points, getting a little bit more difficult here. Does anyone know where I was raised? What state? All right, John. North Carolina, Carolina, that's right. Very few of you will be able to guess what city that is nowhere near North Carolina that I was born in. Any any guesses? Phoenix. (laughs) You like that? You like that segue? Yeah. Anyway, so I'm, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Phoenix because I spent quite a lot of my childhood there. We had friends and family, and we would fly out to Phoenix. We would spend a, a bit of time there, and it was such a weird place because where I grew up was very green and lush, but Phoenix as a city was really inhospitable. Um, it was very, very hot, very, very dry, not much water. A city really should not have been built there to be honest. Um, One summer, it was 46 degrees, and it was so hot. This year, it hit 50 degrees for a whole week. That's very warm. And it's a bizarre place, too, because the air is so dry. Uh, In the summer, when there's a, a lightning storm or like any kind of storm at all, you can see thousands of lightning bolts in any one night. And our friends who live there 
whenever it would occasionally rain, like just a little, they would stand in the car park and dance. So to me, when I was, I don't know, anywhere, anywhere between 9 and 16, 17, I thought it was just the most bizarre place. But even back then, knowing what a phoenix was, was this this bird, this majestic bird that was consumed with fire and was reduced to ashes. And it rose from those ashes. I thought, this city reminds me a bit of that. Because you can go on the top of a mountain and you can look over 50 miles across the valley and you can see nothing but light. Loads and loads of light on every street pouring out. You can't even see the stars in the sky. It's so bright. You can see loads of air traffic and loads of of vehicle traffic and life is just everywhere. And it it just amazes me to think that the fifth largest city in America came from that wasteland and now there's loads of life there. And the reason I thought about that is because of verse 3. and We all said it right when we began our service, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. I've got another image. And it comes from verse 4. There was another promise that said, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. That's quite a promise. Now, does anyone, does anyone enjoy uh, Homes Under the Hammer? There's a lot of people not raising their hands, and that makes me, makes me really upset. <laughs> because you, you might also know, I love buildings. I love buildings. Homes Under the Hammer um, is not unique, I'm sorry to say, because I think every country on earth has... Uh, a show like this, where they take a really dilapidated place, a place that is just crummy and it's just like falling apart. It needs loads of work and you really wouldn't want to live there. And then they take their time with it and they put some love into it and they take their skill and they do all kinds of stuff and they make this place really, really nice. And then they do a big reveal and you see this new flat or this new house and it's just beautiful. Or maybe it was just a a pile of, of, of stones in a field that once was a cottage. And then you walk into this door, they show you this really done up, really nice looking place. It's amazing. The place has been transformed completely. Now that kind of program is my guilty pleasure because I love seeing what can be done with, with rubble and ruins. And actually, that's, what, that's what's being promised to Israel. That's what's being promised to Israel. Is he says, we will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places that were long devastated. That gave them hope. And so when Jesus is saying, like, I'm going to give you guys hope to rebuild your places that are in ruins, and it's going to be amazing. Jesus had a whole kingdom in mind for us. Isn't that amazing? Nightmares turns into wonderful dreams, eyesores that have been transformed into masterpieces. There's one more. There's one more example that I want to share with you. So verses 4 through 9 is the rest of the, the bits of hope that God is saying, I'm just, I'm going to pour out blessing on you. I'm going to double your blessing. And that's what gives the Israelites so much hope. It's, oh man, things are going to be so good. They're, they're going to be transformed from ashes to crowns, from ruins to mansions. It's going to be amazing. Verse 11 is the last verse of actually Isaiah responding with praise last two verses of this chapter of hope is Isaiah's response. And he can't help because ashes to crowns and ruins to amazing mansions, he says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. And that's just a natural reaction. 
You see, Israel was a really broken place. A lot like us before we meet Jesus. Ashes, mourning, despair, and it needed restoration. And there's this proclamation of hope that's being delivered now. Not just for back then, but now. The last image that I want you to think about. And you might have to, you might have to think back in your memory. And please feel free to raise your hand if you've seen something like this. But have you ever seen the remnants of a forest fire? Andy has. John has. All loads of people have. That's amazing. It's a weird feeling, isn't it? It's a weird feeling going through a, a burned forest. I think when I was 19 or, or 20-ish, uh, I drove through Yellowstone National Park. And in the very beginning of the trip, right as you go into the park, we saw the worst of what had just been a really bad forest fire. And it went on for miles. So when you're driving through this bit, all you can see is just char. And everything's black and dark and lifeless. And it's wilderness. So eventually, we get through that bit and we get to the beautiful part of Yellowstone. And it really is pretty spectacular. There's loads of like volcanoes and, and geysers and all kinds of stuff that is really interesting, like waterfalls. It's just beautiful. And if you think that that is the end of the illustration, you'd be wrong because that's just the natural order of things, isn't it? A charred forest that was a fire will eventually grow into a nice forest, eventually. It takes a long time. But what I'd like you to think about is something else, something that I'm sure you've probably been to, and that's the botanics. Have you ever been to the botanics? Yeah. Yeah, we've all been to the botanics. I like to go in at the west entrance. You go in through the building normally. And then you, you go into this amazing lush area. It opens up, you go up the hill, and there's pockets of beauty everywhere. It's like an orchestra of 13,000 different, completely different plants. And they're ordered in a way that make, make each one stand out. They're ordered in a way that make the grouping look particularly interesting. The whole thing is beautiful. You go through paths that, that meander, and it's so carefully, wonderfully put together over hundreds of years, loads of work. And one thing that I like about the botanics is it's free. It's completely free, and anybody can go in. Anybody can go in anytime, well, when it's open, and see all of the beauty that surrounds it. The reason that that's different from Yellowstone National Park and the best bits is because the botanics are so intentional and they're put together in a wonderful way that is a gift for everybody who goes in. And you know what? That's a lot like the hope that we have in Christ. We have this amazing gift that's been given to us, not naturally, but supernaturally, as in God really planned and put it together and made it woven this story together in such a meaningful and amazing way that at Christmas time, we have this baby that's placed in a manger and we celebrate that hope that is to come. And then years go along, Jesus grows up and he comes into the temple and he says, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. That's amazing. He knows that he will go on and pave the way for us to die on the cross for our sins so that we could be restored. So that if we who were once kind of like a burnt out forest, really needing some help, not all there, not as God intended for us, not as beautiful, God is eventually making us a part of his kingdom, a part of the botanics even. Something really, really special and really amazing. And that's why not just this passage, 
brings us hope for today, but the season that we celebrate brings us hope for today. I imagine yesterday many people would have gotten some news that they weren't prepared for, weren't happy to receive, and that's completely understandable. And yet, if we really think about the whole world and everything that we've been given and everything that we read in Isaiah 61 about the restoration that is to come and all that God has done for us in redeeming us in such a wonderful way from ashes to a crown, from ruins to a wonderful place to be, and growing into the kingdom of God. We have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot of hope to have in the present. 